My name is uh, Santiago Hidalgo, one of the moderators for this morning's uh, presentation. I am the director of the Cinemedia's Research Lab at the University of Montreal and a member of the TechNES International Partnership on Cinema Technology, uh, both proud partners uh, of this conference. Uh, I would like to congratulate the main organizers, Alana, Cal, uh, Philippe, for this uh, wonderful event. And I would also like to thank the members of my lab, uh, especially Caroline Martin, uh, Joël Liman, and Thomas Carrière Lafleur, who also helped in the organization uh, of this uh, conference. Originally, uh, the conference was supposed to include a retrospective of Douglas Trumbull's uh, film work at the Cinémathèque Québécoise uh, here in Montreal. And at this retrospective, there was also going to be a screening of Trumbull Land, a uh, 2018 documentary uh, directed by Gregory Wallet on Douglas Trumbull. Uh, unfortunately, the event could not take place for reasons you know. So instead, uh, we've invited Gregory, uh, who is very familiar with Douglas Trumbull's work and also Douglas's place of work since Douglas lives next to a large uh, high-tech private studio uh, where he continues to develop uh, his new film technology and projects uh, to present uh, Douglas Trumbull today. Gregory is not only an aspiring filmmaker, uh, but also a researcher, a lecturer at the University of Rennes II, and a member of the TechNES uh, partnership. Uh, Trumbull Land illustrates uh, Gregory's Wallet's passion for the history of immersion, which he approaches from his background in cognitive science and in relation to the question of spectator uh, reception. I would like to mention as well that along with his colleagues, Marc Christy, Simon Danielou, and Jean-Baptiste Massouet, Gregory will be one of the organizers of a conference entitled De l'immersion au cinéma, from immersion to cinema, at Rennes in France from May 18th, 20th, um, next year, 2021. If you are interested in this event, uh, please note that you have until January 11th to submit a proposal. The call for papers is available at an address I hope to be able to paste in the chat box uh, shortly. At the conclusion of Doug's presentation, feel free to use whatever means available to ask your questions. Um, if you prefer to send your questions in French, or to ask your questions in French, I will do my best uh, to translate them for Doug. So without further ado, I present Gregory Wallet, who will deliver his introductory remarks in French. Um, I'm going to, once I'm finished talking here, share my screen so you can see the text in English uh, while Gregory talks and read along as he uh, presents. So thank you very much and enjoy uh, the presentation. Merci Santiago, je prends donc uh, la suite. Oui. Je veux juste uh, partager mon écran. Vas-y, oui. Merci Santiago, hello everybody. And uh, sorry to make this, this uh, introduction uh, in French. Uh, so, je souhaiterais commencer donc en indiquant que je suis très uh, honoré de présider cette conférence de Douglas Trumbull. Je remercie à nouveau les organisateurs du colloque pour cette invitation. Et comme vous le savez toutes et tous, donc Trumbull est un nom particulièrement associé à l'immersion au cinéma, puisque depuis ses débuts dans l'industrie uh, cinématographique, uh, la carrière de Douglas Trumbull est centrée sur sa volonté d'immerger le spectateur. Dès, 64, dès 1964, euh, Douglas Trumbull participa avec John Whitney à la conception des effets visuels du film « To the Moon and Beyond » de Con Pedersen, un film documentaire d'animation qui proposait à l'époque d'aller du Big Bang au microcosme en 15 minutes 
et en utilisant le procédé New Cinerama 360. Le film, euh, tourné donc à l'époque avec un objectif fisheye, fut projeté sur un écran dôme pendant l'exposition New York World's Fair de 1964. Donc, ça a été la première expérience de Douglas avec le cinéma immersif. Puis, cet intérêt de Douglas pour l'immersion se renforça lors de son travail sur les effets spéciaux du film 2001, l'Odyssée de l'espace de Stanley Kubrick, qui fut tourné, vous le savez, en 70 mm Super Panavision Cinérama. Et pendant ce tournage, Douglas prit conscience qu'il voulait poursuivre dans cette voie et reproduire l'intensité de ce type de spectacle cinématographique immersif instauré par Kubrick pour 2001. Douglas voulait et veut toujours explorer de nouvelles pistes et repousser les limites du cinéma conventionnel. Il a donc appliqué cette quête d'immersion à l'ensemble de ses travaux, comme cinéaste, comme technicien des effets spéciaux et comme inventeur de dispositifs pour la prise de vue et pour la projection. Alors, comme technicien des effets spéciaux, Douglas a toujours créé des effets organiques, particulièrement absorbants, qui mettent le spectateur dans un état contemplatif. Les effets visuels réalisés par Douglas Trumbull apparaissent pour moi comme des moments de suspension au sein de la narration, tout en s'y intégrant parfaitement. Ils immergent les spectateurs dans ce qu'on pourrait appeler un espace-temps imaginaire. Alors, on retrouve particulièrement cette volonté d'immersion dans les séquences qu'il a entièrement réalisées pour les films d'autres cinéastes, le franchissement de la Porte des étoiles par l'astronaute David Bowman dans 2001, les apparitions sonores et lumineuses des ovnis dans Rencontre du troisième type de Spielberg, le survol des rues poisseuses d'un Los Angeles futuriste dans Blade Runner de, de Ridley Scott, ou encore la découverte par Spock de l'entité Vejir dans Star Trek, le film de Robert Wise, ou beaucoup plus tard, la représentation du Big Bang dans The Tree of Life de Terence Malick. Ensuite, comme réalisateur, Douglas a bien sûr aussi cherché à dépasser le langage conventionnel et à faire des films visuellement plus spectaculaires et immersifs. Alors, ce fut particulièrement le cas avec Brainstorm. Ce film a introduit au cinéma le concept de réalité virtuelle en 1983. Il alterne entre séquences classiques tournées en 35 mm et séquences immersives en 70 mm. C'est, pourrait-on dire, un film immersif sur l'immersion. Comme réalisateur, Douglas a également mis au point des ride movies pour des parcs à thème. Par exemple, il a conçu l'attraction Back to the Future The Ride en 1993 pour les studios Universal. Et c'est d'ailleurs cette attraction qui a rencontré un grand succès à l'époque, qui a permis au studio de Douglas Trumbull de se spécialiser aussi dans le cinéma dynamique. En 1996, par exemple, il réalisa trois attractions différentes pour le Luxor Hotel à Las Vegas. Et ces attractions récoltèrent plusieurs prix. La presse spécialisée à l'époque les décrit comme les meilleures expériences de réalité virtuelle jamais réalisées. Douglas Trumbull, c'est aussi, vous le savez, un inventeur. Et comme inventeur, il peut être considéré comme un pionnier. Il a déposé une trentaine de brevets liés à la prise de vue ou à la projection audiovisuelle. Ses recherches sur le cinéma ont commencé dès 1975, année où il fonda avec son associé Richard Yurisich un département de recherche au sein de la Paramount, la Future General Corporation. C'est au sein de la Future General que Trumbull développa par exemple le procédé Shosken, qui utilisait à l'époque des, des pellicules 70 mm, entre 35 pour le format standard, et un défilement à 60 images par seconde, entre 24 images par seconde pour le défilement, le défilement standard. Pardon. Ensuite, dans les années 80-90, Trumb Trumbull améliora encore son Shosken, qui fut utilisé dans différentes salles de cinéma spécialisées, comme celle du parc Futuroscope en France, par exemple. Et Douglas travaille encore aujourd'hui sur le cinéma de demain. Les studios Trumbull sont pour moi comme un laboratoire où Douglas expérimente pour le futur de l'industrie cinématographique. L'un de ses derniers dispositifs immersifs se nomme Maji. Il propose une image en relief, en 4K, et avec un défilement à 120 images par seconde. 
Maggi permet donc de tourner puis de diffuser des films avec une image en relief incroyablement nette, fluide et lumineuse. Et comme Douglas le dit lui-même, avec le dispositif Maggi, les lumières s'éteignent dans la salle, l'écran disparaît et une fenêtre s'ouvre sur ce qui semble être un monde bien réel. Alors donc Douglas va aujourd'hui vous présenter sa quête d'immersion à travers ses 50 ans d'expérience dans l'industrie cinématographique. Il mettra aussi en avant les potentialités du numérique pour l'immersion du spectateur et vous parlera de ses dernières découvertes. Voilà, je vous remercie. I will now give him the floor. It's your Douglas. Thank you, Greg. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yes, we can. Doug. Okay, good. All right, here we go. So, um, shall I just start? I, uh, first, I wanted I just wanted to mention uh, my thanks to uh, Charles Ackland for his presentation yesterday on Brainstorm, which I thought was very uh, accurate and astute and interesting, and I learned a lot. <laughs> so uh, he did a really great job with that. And thank you, uh, uh, Santiago and uh, Joel and all the team, uh, Technus, and I'm happy to be here today with you and uh, I hope this presentation goes smoothly. So what do we do next to get all this right. started? So share screen. Okay, we'll go to share screen and we do desktop. Desktop, the sound. Share computer sound, there we go. Okay, click on yeah. your keynote icon. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, now, you, no, 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 it's already open. Oh, it is open. Yeah. Where is it? Oh, it's there it is. Up. Okay, there it is. Okay. We'll okay. Play can mode. Everybody, can everybody see that now? Or you can yeah. see it? All right. Now, now, now it's in full it. screen, yes. Okay, here we go. All right. Well, my talk today is about uh, immersive cinema and my work in trying to enlarge and expand on what the motion picture medium can be. Um, and I've had a lot of unusual experiences in making films for dome screens. Like this is a dome screen in the background of this photograph, like in a planetarium. That was my first job for the New York World's Fair before I worked on 2001 uh, with Stanley Kubrick. And uh, the conclusions that I have come to that are actually quite recent are that the entire process of seeing a movie or seeing anything in reality or television or anything else is all happening in your mind. It's happening in your eye and your eyes have retinas, which are your receptive light receptors. And that goes into your brain. And so an image enters the uh, iris of your eye. It goes to the retina of your eye and into your brain. And through some amazing process, uh, you seem to see the real world outside of you, but you have to understand, this is a existential concept that we're projecting the world out and we believe that it's really there, but the only place the world is or a movie is or a television show is, is on the retina of your eye. And so it's an entirely mental process. It's also stereoscopic when we see 3D right in front of us, but we don't see 3D off to the sides. Um, and we also hear uh, stereophonically, we hear sounds from, coming from all directions. Our brains and minds are incredibly sensitive instruments to perceive reality. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the whole idea of exploring more immersive storytelling and experience making I, I, I differentiate experience making from storytelling because it is what I do as an artist. And I will try to show you clips. Doug Trumbull is a man with an idea. So this is Roger Ebert. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. Could look more realistic and be more involving than they are. Roger Ebert was a big fan of mine for many years and was very helpful in helping me promote my show scan process and changes to the movie industry. Hi, I'm Doug Trumbull. When I was growing up, I was entranced with movies. I loved the giant screen spectacle of Cinerama and admired the directors who worked in this fantastic medium, drawing audiences into amazing and almost overwhelming immersive experiences. The Cinerama screens were 90 feet wide 
and you felt surrounded by the deeply curved image. When George Marshall directed the train sequence in How the West Was Won, I was amazed at how he managed to adapt his directorial style to the ultra-wide three-camera Cinerama medium. When David Lean made Lawrence of Arabia in 70mm Super Panavision, I was convinced that powerful dramatic stories could be told on the giant screen. My first experience working on a 70mm giant screen movie was as an illustrator on the Cinerama 360-degree dome screen movie To the Moon and Beyond for the New York World's Fair. It was like a planetarium with a movie instead of the sky. It was seen by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke confirming their belief that they could make what Stanley called the first good science fiction movie, also saying that he felt an obligation to make 2001 A Space Odyssey to be how the universe was won. So I was profoundly affected by the fact that my father made certain uh, that I saw all the latest technologies going on in the movie industry, and one of the biggest one in the 1950s, when I was very young, uh, 10 years old, was Cinerama, which was this three projector, three camera process with an ultra wide, deeply curved screen. And at the top of the, this diagram here, you can see the deeply curved screen and all the seats. And I was profoundly affected by that. And I was very lucky later on to work for Stanley Kubrick on 2001. So you can kind of see a, a miniature here of a representation of the screen and the seating and the, and the uh, projection booths, three of them, one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. And this was all profoundly effective to me. And I became a big fan of science fiction and started painting science fiction illustrations that were in my portfolio as a young man. And uh, this was working on To the Moon and Beyond for the New York World's Fair. You can see the artwork is circular. The whole movie was a big circular film format. Uh, this was 10 perforation, 70 millimeter film projected and photographed with fisheye lenses onto a giant screen at the fair. And Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke saw this movie. And that's how I ended up working for Stanley Kubrick on 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm going to show you a quick little clip of 2001, I believe, is next. Oh, this is a, this is a project I want to talk about. This is a demo for a documentary film I was trying to make for, Univer for uh, Warner Brothers. Now. Good afternoon. How's everything been going after all these 40 years? Everything is going extremely well. You know, Dave Larson and I are working on a documentary about the making of the movie. We've got all these photographs, just incredible stuff, the behind the scenes production. May I see them? Sure. There's a, an early moon watcher. Can you hold it a bit closer? Sure, hold on. There's an early design for the Discovery spacecraft. Kubrick at the Super Panavision Cinerama camera. Appropriate for the movie, some special green screen shooting that we're going to do where Kier Delay, Gary Lockwood, myself. Dan so Richter, this documentary film all never all got right made. It was canceled by Warner Brothers, but it was a very movie. early experiment in virtual why production here, why that was so way. that I could actually enter into the movie and walk around in the sets and props and interact with the actors. Uh, I'm really sad that this movie never got made and probably never will be made because it's not supported by Warner Brothers who own the MGM library. Do you think it's gonna be a documentary that really tells the story of the making of 2001? Not just the technical story, but the human story, the personal story, the experiences of people who interacted with Kubrick that is really true to the style and the look of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which still holds up today. So, I'll show you another little quick clip. Uh, and 2001 and, and the later pictures that everybody thought were in Cinerama were really in this single lens process, which was allowed them to be much more fluid and essentially make the films in a somewhat more cinematic way. Uh, they were projected on a curved screen, so I think they lost something when they gave up the three projector system, but they gained a lot of flexibility in the ability to make the pictures. And I, I think probably the later pictures are, are better because of it. And now, your journey is just beginning.
So that's just a little piece of 2001. Um, this was my first experience with uh, an unusual film format, which for the day was only being shown in a few theaters. Uh, here's a shot inside the centrifuge set and you're gonna see this big fisheye lens. I guess you can't see my cursor, but uh, it's a fisheye lens on a 65 millimeter Mitchell camera uh, for these ultra wide angle shots, which was part of my beginning uh, uh, immersive experience photography with Kubrick. And here's me uh, as a young man working on lunar landscapes for 2001. Uh, it's a very long story to tell you how I designed this lunar landscape, which is quite different from the lunar landscapes we ended up using in the movie. This is uh, the Cinerama Panav Ultra Panavision, excuse me, Super Panavision 65 millimeter camera on a rotating rig because there's a lot of rotating shots in the film. Uh, this is inside the centrifuge. This is me, Stanley Kubrick on the left and the crew and uh, Gary Lockwood and Pierre DeLay on the right, both with what look like iPads, uh, very advanced, but they're just 35 millimeter movies rear projected from beneath the table. Um, after I worked on 2001 and had this amazing experience of uh, learning a lot uh, with Kubrick as my mentor about making movies. Uh, I felt that I should try my own hand at making my own movies. And so Silent Running was the first attempt at me directing a movie and writing the treatment for it and helping write the screenplay for it. So I'll show you a quick clip of Silent Running. So there's Bruce Dern and the drones and this should play. So Silent Running was uh, my first work as a director and a designer. And um, the story was based on these drones that were performed by young people that had no lower bodies, no legs. Uh, so it was really interesting to direct drones. <laughs> and um, we shot a lot of the uh, interiors of the domes in the movie on an aircraft carrier, an airplane hangar, excuse me, at an airport uh, with rented trees and a pr front projection machine that I built for the movie that was based on what I learned from Kubrick working on the Dawn of Man sequence for 2001. So we had a very small portable front projection machine. Um, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead because I don't have a lot of time today. This all led to my frustration that uh, Silent Running was a 35 millimeter conventional movie. I didn't try to do anything like 2001. It was a very low budget of about a million dollars. And I started experimenting with uh, high frame rates as a way of making movies better. And it was with a company called Future General Corporation that Greg mentioned. Thank you, Greg, for your introduction, by the way. Um, Future General was a research and development subsidiary of Paramount Pictures. And I'm gonna show you a quick little clip of Future General whenever that comes up. This was one of our theaters. You can see it's a fairly large screen relative to the audience. Uh, it's curved. And I'll show you this clip, I think. I formed Future General Corporation to explore the future of cinema. We tried different film formats such as VistaVision, Todd AO, Super Panavision, and IMAX. We also shot tests at 24, 36, 48, 60, 66, and 72 frames per second. We attached sensors to the viewers in a laboratory, proving that high frame rates were the real key to improving human visual stimulation and creating a powerful sense of realism. We received a US patent on what became known as ShowScan 60 frame per second, 70 millimeter film. <clears throat> Suddenly the surface of the screen went away. It became like a 3D movie, even though it was 2D. Frame rates got you to much more like what reality is with us right now. This led to the business development of the show scan process of 70 millimeter film at 60 frames per second. Formed future oh, shoot. Yeah, I'll try to get past that. So, when I had developed show scan at Paramount, 
uh, the management at Paramount wanted me to explore how to make a feature film in this process. And they knew I was already a director. And so I got the green light to start developing Brainstorm, starring Christopher Walken, Natalie Wood, Louise Fletcher, and Cliff Robertson uh, for Paramount to be the first film to be made in the show scan process. So I felt that my whole idea of making an immersive movie about an immersive technology would really be a major breakthrough. And that uh, in the movie, it talks about these kind of recording tapes, these holographic recording tapes, and uh, that you could actually record someone's thoughts or feelings or experiences and play them back to someone else. And so we constructed a whole story about that concept, which leads to uh, a key moment in the movie where Louise Fletcher, who is already dying of lung cancer, is going to have a big heart attack. And she decides to record her death because she's in the laboratory when she has the heart attack. She makes a recording of her death. And then the rest of the movie is about Christopher Walken, determined to play this tape back and find out if there's anything after life, you know, is there some alternate reality or some cosmic consciousness or uh, out of body experiences or anything? So that was what the movie was really about. And we developed this whole idea of what we called memory bubbles. That was kind of a infinite universe of memories and ideas and thoughts and inventions that you see as clips in the movie. And sadly, because of the intransigence of the movie industry and the studios, I wasn't able to make Brainstorm in the show scan process. These are just some examples of some of the headgear that we designed as props in the movie. Um, and I'll see what the next slide is. Oh, here we go. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back. This is about Brainstorm few moments you will have an experience which will seem completely real. It's a superconducting chip. Keep it quiet. I think you're moving too fast. God, that's remarkable. A true, one-of-a-kind scientific breakthrough. We're interested in tapping into higher brain function. We're working on that too. Shut up, Michael. So it's kind of hard to encapsulate an entire movie in, in a one minute clip, but that gives you a little feeling for Brainstorm, the movie, uh, which ultimately uh, was made in a combination of 35 millimeter and 70 millimeter. So the aspect ratio of the film changed from narrow to wide, from monophonic sound to stereo sound, but I was never able to actually make the movie in the show scan process at 60 frames per second, 70 millimeter on these specially equipped theaters. Just I wasn't able to make that happen. And that was back in the uh, early 80s. So it was a huge disappointment for me that I wasn't able to make it happen, but I'm still trying. Uh, this is me looking good when I was younger, making this movie. Uh, this is one of the rigs we used uh, on the set in and on locations. And you can see that that fisheye lens is very similar to the same fisheye lenses that Stanley Kubrick was using on 2001 A Space Odyssey. So that's a similar fisheye lens in the centrifuge of 2001. And here is a clip, I think, excuse me. This is the fisheye lens of the point of view of Christopher Walken, who is in the hospital after having played this uh, death tape and, and nearly having a heart attack himself. So the idea, in this one of the ideas in the story was that when he played this incredibly powerful sensory tape of Louise Fletcher having a heart attack, he starts having a heart attack. So it has a hugely powerful physiological impact. And that led to shots like this, which is his point of view of Natalie Wood and the doctor in the hospital uh, being resuscitated. So there's a lot of this cutting back and forth between conventional cinema and point of view, first person cinema, which is what I've been exploring for years. Uh, this is on the set. You can see the fisheye lens on the right. You can see the laboratory set. 
uh, Richard Yurisich on the left and Chris Walken behind him in the first helmet. This has all led to this kind of concept I've been working on for many, many years, what I call hyper cinema, other names, uh, which is how do we take the motion picture experience and make it better than it is? And how do we even get re to restoring what I saw as a kid in the 1950s of Cinerama? Because today's, uh, excuse me, I'm, I've got so much I'm trying to cram in here in such a short period of time. In today's movie business, we have multiplex cinemas, which have replaced the large screen IMAX, excuse me, and the Cinerama and D150 and Todd AO movies of the past have been replaced by smaller 35 millimeter screens in kind of what I call shoebox auditoriums. And the experience of a movie is really not very immersive and not very spectacular because the screens are relatively small and they're two dimensional and they're flat and they're, you know, they're, they're seemingly larger than your television screen at home. So there is a reason to go out and see a movie on a movie screen. And at the same time, there are what we call premium large format theaters. And there are a number of theaters around the world that have been built and exist now and will continue to be built which are following on to IMAX, which kind of established uh, the large format, large screen cinema business. And I was responsible for that. I, I helped take IMAX public um, many years ago in 1994 to bring IMAX into the mainstream of cinema. And I'll talk about that a little bit later because it relates to uh, the Back to the Future ride. So simulation rides, which is like the Back to the Future ride, are extremely immersive. And the Back to the Future ride is one of the things I'm very proud of because I invented this idea of having a movie on a screen, even if it's a big movie on a dome screen, and uh, it's an immersive visual experience. And it led to Back to the Future, the ride, which is the whole idea that you are entering into the movie by getting into the car, that belongs to Doc Brown, it's his traveling DeLorean. And so in the simulation ride, you're in a DeLorean car. And so you actually, in a way, become Michael J. Fox and enter into the movie and see the movie from his point of view. We later went on to the Luxor Hotel and did a simulation ride there with a whole new kind of motion base and 180 degree wide 48 frame per second VistaVision film projection and photography. And the sad thing about the success of these simulation rides is that they're not really taken seriously by the um, cinema industry. They're looked at as uh, amusement events, not as part of cinema. And I, I think it's very much part of cinema. So I'm very proud to work with Steven Spielberg and Universal on the Back to the Future ride. It was one of the most fun experiences I've ever had in my career. So I'll go on and try to show you some of that. Before the Back to the Future ride, I also developed a thing called Tour of the Universe, which was a show scan film on a large screen inside of a flight simulator. I don't have the interior of this, but this is a 747 scale flight simulator that has 40 seats in it. So the, there's 40 passengers inside that box. And then Disney copied this whole idea and made Star Tours, which is running today still at, at, at the Disney theme parks. So the Back to the Future ride was Steven Spielberg's trying to compete with George Lucas on Back to the Future. Uh, so he was competing with the Star Tours ride. And one of the most interesting things about this is, is, is the issue of money, because if you can't show your investors or your partners that you can make more money with some new technology. You're just not gonna get anywhere. So one of the things that I've been doing in retrospect is looking back at Back to the Future ride, which could handle 2000 riders an hour. It operated 12 hours a day, 360 days a year. There was, it ran for 16 years at three of their parks in Osaka, Japan, Los Angeles and Orlando, Florida. And it operated 115% of park capacity, which meant that everybody who came to the park saw this ride and then went back and saw it again on the same day. 
And if you allow uh, a five dollar allocation out of their their price for the whole park, the gross revenue to Universal over the use of, of this four minute ride was two billion dollars. That's a lot of money for a four minute movie. And so it just shows me that there is actual profitability in immersive entertainment. And it's just not very well understood, but I'm still trying to get to that. And I'll talk about it a little bit more later in my presentation. Um, the problems we've had with doing immersive media, which is usually film up to, up to recently, uh, inside domes is cross reflectance of light in the dome. It's very hard to illuminate a dome. And so you can not get very much brightness. And if you don't have much brightness, you don't have much color saturation or contrast. And 24 frames per second is just not adequate to fill your entire field of view. And if you want to fill your field of view to get rid of blurring and to get rid of strobing and to get rid of nausea, you've got to go to a much higher frame rate, much higher resolution. So the Back to the Future ride was still 24 frames a second, IMAX 15 per 70 film format. Um, it was 180 degree immersion uh, and it was only four minutes long. And in order to accomplish this, we had to actually build new cameras because IMAX didn't have anything but these gigantic cameras. And we needed to build cameras small enough to shoot inside miniatures. We had to fly through miniatures with these tiny cameras. So I engineered, designed, and had built these cameras with these Zeiss fisheye lenses on them. And the cameras were small enough to get inside miniatures. Um, it was the original IMAX 15 per 70 millimeter, 24 frame per second film projection in domes. And one of the weird things that happened to me as a filmmaker in, in anticipating doing this movie is that you know, when you go to a studio and you actually get a green light on your movie and they want to finance it, one of the questions they might ask you is, you know, how much raw stock do you need? How much footage of film? We need to order, you know, 200,000 feet of film or whatever. I was asked how many gallons of hydraulic fluid would be needed for this ride. And so I had to mock up the entire ride hypothetically and put it into this ride vehicle that represented the eight passengers of the DeLorean car, which I have sandbags in there to represent the weight of the passengers. And so they could meter out how much hydraulic fluid they would need for the ride. This is the IMAX fisheye projector used on the ride onto the dome screen. Uh, this is my facility in the Berkshires where we made the Back to the Future ride. We had one of the DeLorean cars we had a control system we set up so that we could control the movement of the car in relationship to the movement of the film. And this is part of the car inside of a 30 foot diameter high school planetarium dome. The projector is up on the right behind the car, shooting over the car. And we had to mock this entire thing up in order to look at our dailies, tests of miniatures and things. Uh, from the car. We had to see the movie from the point of view of the car while we were in production. This was one of the major solutions that I proposed to Spielberg and Universal in order to get this to work because there was a huge issue of uh, nausea and motion sickness that was happening with the previous people that were trying to make the ride and failing. So they spent millions of dollars trying to make this film and everyone was throwing up. And that's when I was brought in to kind of solve this fundamental problem um, by mocking this whole thing up at my studio. And we had to build a film developing lab in the Berkshires at my studio so that we could shoot black and white reversal 15 per 70 millimeter film in that miniature camera and then project it onto this dome with the IMAX projector. And by the time we would project it, I would have a motion profile for the movement of the car to figure out how to avoid motion sickness and create thrills instead of nausea. So the Back to the Future ride was quite an amazing experience for me of miniatures and classic uh, motion control photography using computerized motion control camera rigs. And we had a 32 channel robotic dinosaur. And that was one of the criteria we had to meet, which was how to get the camera inside the mouth of the dinosaur. 
So that was kind of a fun scene. That's the dinosaur, the DeLorean car, and the camera all in one shot. And the, the car, the DeLorean car, which you're chasing, is on wires. And you can't see the wires because we shot in a lot of smoke and we're very careful about photography. We had no uh, computer graphics, no optical, I mean, with no way to do wire removal. We had to shoot everything in camera without any optical printing. And we had to have a big, uh, the car had to go down a uh, volcano and into lava and uh, uh, into a, a crevasse of a glacier. The, the movie was really spectacular and really a wonderful and fun thing to build. These are all miniatures. And then at the very end of the movie, we catch up with Biff who's stolen Doc Brown's car and he crashes back into the lab and we save the day. It was a real epiphany. Oh, I realized that. Wait a minute. Sorry. I realized that the future. I got to go back. It was a real epiphany for me. It was the Back to the Future ride, which Steven Spielberg asked me to direct. And they couldn't quite figure out how to make it work. And so they asked me to try to solve these problems for the Back to the Future ride. And I said, that's exactly something I think I can contribute to. And I directed and mostly wrote and produced the Back to the Future ride for Universal Studios Tours. And that to me is a piece of cinema. We really achieved a kind of super intense virtual reality. So that was uh, a big extravagant experiment in uh, how to tell an immersive story in, f in four minutes, knowing that the audience has already seen the trilogy of feature films directed by Bob Zemeckis and produced by Steven Spielberg. So they know who the characters are and they know roughly what the story is. And our whole challenge was how to create an immersive experience that had drama, had a story, had action, had all the things of movies with the addition of hydraulic motion and physiological stimulation and the immersiveness of a movie all around you and 32 channels of sound. And it was quite a, an incredible experience for me to work on uh, because I was so uh, entranced and, and determined to try to produce immersive experiences. I'm gonna show you another quick clip that will explain it a little bit better. It'll play. I realized that the future of the cinema was actually emerging in world's fairs, theme park attractions, and special venue processes where you can. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I realized that the future of the cinema was actually emerging in world's fairs, theme park attractions, and special venue processes where you can use new techniques, new lenses, new screens, new sound systems, and experiment with the cinematic experience. This really peaked for me when I was working on the Back to the Future ride for Steven Spielberg and Universal. And that was the one of the key times I felt we really achieved 
a kind of super intense virtual reality of having a, an image that completely surrounds your field of view. So you've actually entered the movie and become a participant in that movie. You feel like you're in the movie. I just can't believe that they could do that. The real hero behind this is Douglas Trumbull, who really put it together and created the visuals, which really is what the ride's all about. Doug Trumbull is a man with an idea. And the idea is that movies could look more realistic and be more involving than they are. There's a new direction for the cinema to go. And I've committed myself for years on that path, but allowing the audience now to actually have buttons and controls and actually affect what happens with characters on the screen, how the drama unfolds, what their involvement is, and actually feel like they're a part of it. This technology we're developing is all part of a broader program here to develop a revolution in digital production. So I think that's kind of a quick overview of what I've been trying to do. And that leads to where we are today, which was, which is that movie theaters are unable to deliver anything like that. Uh, movie theaters are still screens in a room with seats and a sound system and a 24 frame per second, basically 35 or rarely 70 millimeter film. And a, a conventional movie theater like this has a flat rectangular screen. The rows of seats are flat. The floor is slightly raked. It's not anything all that spectacular. And if you look at it from the top, it's just, it's not great. The, the leftover from the early days of cinema where the, where the screens were small and not very bright is still with us today in the multiplex cinema concept. And so, I'm just trying to figure out how can we progress forward and bring to the movie experience in theaters a more immersive kind of movie uh, experience. This is kind of a hypothetical layout of a Cinerama theater. It's a cylindrically curved screen, originally three projectors and three cameras that became 70 millimeters, single film. And then IMAX, and I was principal, you can see the relationship of the small movie screen relative to the size of a giant IMAX screen. This has been a pioneer in the world of what we call uh, Im immersive and spectacular premium large format. And now uh, exhibitors have been copying IMAX and getting 4K digital projectors and large screens and rebranding it with their own name for whatever the theater chain is so that they have a more spectacular experience. What I've been doing is this Magi process, which is deeply curved screen uh, in two directions, vertically and horizontally. It's a very high gain screen to keep the brightness up in order to make 3D as bright as 2D. And I am shooting at 120 frames per second in 4K 3D and 2D. That's what this Magi process is about that I've been working on. Here is just a hypothetical combination of all the different possible screen sizes and shapes, including, you know, large, a very small cinema screen in the left and a giant Cinerama screen in the back and an IMAX screen and all the screens in between. So I've been studying screen sizes and screen shapes and seating of theaters and realizing that it's the theater end of the industry that's really making it difficult uh, to uh, move into a more immersive cinematic experience. Because even if you present a better picture on an existing movie theater screen, it really can't get much more spectacular because the screen is simply not wide enough. So here's some kind of fields of view studies we've done on theaters and seating. And here is some more hypothetical ideas about what the theater of the future could be, which is ultra wide, ultra deeply curved, um, a little different shape. And these are the screens that we were building for the simulation rides when we were at IMAX, where there's about 15 passengers on a motion base facing the screen. And the screen image was 48 frames per second, uh, 35 millimeter VistaVision format. And in the Magi Pod, which is the theater that I've been developing, which is a completely new concept, is to have 3D 4K at 120 frames per second, full 14 foot lamberts of brightness. And it's a hybrid between a rectangular frame and a hemispheric high gain dome screen because 
in order to have, in order to tell a story, you can't really tell a story in a dome. You have to have a proscenium arch that shows you the sides and top and bottom so you can frame, aesthetically frame shots and tell a story. You have to be able to edit. So editing is really important. So that gets us to what I'm doing with this Magi process. To get today's audiences to be engaged by what a truly immersive entertainment experience can be, we've designed the ultimate movie theater for an immersive movie experience, the Magi Pod. They're 20 feet high and occupy 900 square feet. The pod is a prefabricated theater that seats 40 viewers. The field of view you generally get when watching an iPad is about 25 degrees wide, similar to a television screen. The field of view in a conventional movie theater is about 50 degrees wide, depending upon where you sit in the theater. The Magi Pod is equipped with a hemispherically curved torus screen offering a field of view of more than 100 degrees wide, even more than Cinerama once offered. Although the screen is only 32 feet wide, the 3D effect is much more comfortable to watch than in a conventional theater because the pod offers the combination of high brightness, high resolution, high frame rate, and wide field of view, creating a much more immersive experience. In a traditional theater with a low gain flat screen, light cross reflecting off the screen is wasted to the floor, walls, and ceiling. With a curved high gain torus screen, more light reflects back to the audience, increasing the brightness of a 3D movie and dramatically reducing cross-reflectance. Unlike traditional theaters that can only provide three to six foot lamperts of light, Magi Pods provide an image that is three times brighter, resulting in 16 foot lamperts. The pods house a Christie Mirage 4K projector capable of projecting movies in 3D, 4K, and at 120 frames per second. This projection system provides between five to 10 times the visual information of the industry standards of 3D movie theaters. Magi Pods will have eye-catching architecture, lighting, and digital signage, and can also be custom designed to suit any site. We have designed these prefabricated modular theaters so that they can easily be introduced into thousands of existing interior space locations around the world, creating an entirely new exhibition industry. Any number of pods can be arranged to achieve any desired hourly capacity, rivaling larger theaters at significantly lower cost. Magi Pods will be modestly priced and can be quickly set up in existing interior locations around the world, such as museums, special venue attractions like the Kennedy Space Center, the Grand Canyon, theme parks, water parks, zoos, aquariums, planetariums, trade shows, shopping malls, sporting events, historic landmarks, music festivals, cruise ships, and universities, offering an experience that is completely independent from the limitations of conventional movie standards and delivering an experience that is so real it seems as if there's no screen at all. Media technology and creativity, using our facilities and talents to push the envelope of immersive experiences and dramatic productions. Ufotog in the Magi process represents the future of moving images. So it mentions Jufotog, which is a short 10 minute demonstration film we've made in this process uh, about going on an adventure into deep space and encountering an alien civilization. And uh, it's just a very simple little demonstration film, but I wanted to make a demonstration film that would explore all of the possibilities of adapting cinema to this medium and showing uh, viewers that we can make a movie experience that is still cinematic. It doesn't look like a television show, even though it's twice the frame rate of television uh, and it's portable and it's, you could pop this thing up in about a week and we could have a, thousands of them around the world and we could use it as an adjunct to the existing commercial cinema industry uh, because there are millions of square feet of empty space in shopping malls all over the world now because of the abandonment of retail uh, shopping and malls. So there's plenty of space. And that's what I've been doing here at my studio, at Trumbull Studios, is we have a laboratory for exploring the future of cinema and the whole future of immersive experiences and adapting these uh, new high frame rate, high resolution, high brightness, laser illuminated, <laughs> immersive experiences to storytelling. That's kind of the theme of my show today. So my whole um, drive in making movies is how to get even further 
along that road of a first-person experience to where the audience gets a chance to feel much more immersed in what's going on and much more personally involved in what's going on. And uh, I've been very frustrated by the nature of the motion picture process itself because, you know, motion pictures are very powerful. They're really wonderful. They tell stories just great. And the standards of the industry, which really have been at like 35 millimeter film at 24 frames a second on a rectangular screen in a darkened room. That's a movie in a theater. And that started 90 years ago. And um, what I realized that that standard was set, that 24 frame per second standard was set in 1927 to enable sound on film for the jazz singer. And that standard has been the same ever since. For this whole time, it's been the same. People have pushed away from that standard a little bit. Uh, Mike Todd, who was doing these, uh, D, uh, these Todd A.O. movies, the giant 70 millimeter movies, realized that 24 frames was inadequate. He changed to 30 frames. He probably would have gone to a higher frame rate if there had been technology to enable that at the time, but it wasn't possible to go much faster than that. So everyone who's done a giant screen movie an epic spectacle, and even a Cinerama movies, realized that the 24 frames is not enough. And that if you had more frames, then there'd be less blurring, less strobing. You could have faster camera motion. You could have bigger stunt scenes and more action that wouldn't be all blurred and distorted. And everyone's been feeling that ever since. I mean, every cinematographer and director knows that you have to be very cautious about how you move the camera because it'll blur and strobe. It'll be very uh, annoying to the audience. So I've been trying to design everything from what the theater is like inside the theater to what it's like outside the theater to make a much more interesting social experience for people to where the exteriors of the theater actually have projections on them. They're actually spheres of different sizes and shapes. So there's different capacities. This whole thing could be in a portable tented structure that could be carried around to parking lots or anything. So virtual production is another part of what we've been doing, which is how to make movies for less money by shooting with green screens and motion control. And uh, I'll show you a quick clip of that, but we're running out of time. So someone's got to give me a cue as to when you want me to stop, but I'll just keep going for as <laughs> until we run out of time. Uh, I'm gonna... I, think you can, uh, I think you can go for another few minutes. Uh... And I'll consult with the organizers in the meanwhile. Okay. This is a movie that I'm developing called Lightship. Um, I'm not sure this movie's ever going to be made, but the, the whole script has been written specifically to uh, uh, show a movie at 120 frame 3D 4K. And you're going to see some shots here of camera systems that are robotic and automatic and remotely controlled that are using digital tracking markers up in the ceiling of the stage so that we're compositing actors into um, uh, miniatures and computer generated environments using 3D cameras like this. These are two lenses side by side. that are shooting 4K, 60 frames per eye in this Magi process. And um, we're exploring how do we make the movie exhibition industry meet the movie production industry and make it into a set of tools that any director, cinematographer, editor, production designer, art director can understand and use and do it in such a way that even the actors will know how to do what they do so well, which is to act dramatically. Even though we're tremendously amplifying the impact of what the results are on the screen in the theater. So I've been at this for many, many years, and I'm, I can guarantee you it's a surefire way to go broke um, because the, the, the industry is so hard to change that changing the course of the movie industry toward a more immersive um, motion picture experience is extremely expensive. And you meet a lot of resistance because They've already got their theaters. They've invested in their theaters. They don't want to buy a new projector or a new screen or anything else. And so making change is, is extremely difficult. 
And while I was at IMAX, uh, they were developing this IMAX Salido camera. This is a good example of why we had to build special tiny cameras for the Back to the Future, right? Because this 3D camera for IMAX weighs 300 pounds and it's very, very noisy. And I'm not trying to badmouth IMAX. I'm just saying that these are the stepping stones. The engineering that went into this camera was extraordinary. This was one of the steps along the way toward, toward a more immersive um, 3D experience in a dome screen environment. Uh, these are some of my experiments with adapting uh, high speed um, phantom cameras to dual lens systems. I'm not going to go into it, but I've developed this Magi process and we're getting the cameras down to a very, very small size. And by adapting uh, industrial cameras that are used for other purposes. So we can do 3D, they're small, they're lightweight, and they're inexpensive. And we can put them inside cockpits of aircraft. We can put them on blimps, balloons. You can do hang gliding or anything you want to do is photographable as easily as we would ordinarily do with something like a GoPro camera. The Ufotog demo movie, I'll show you just a little bit of that called Ufotog. The experiment was fully dramatic, actors, dialogue, live action, music, computer graphics, and digital compositing in a 10 minute demonstration film that's being shown on this extremely wide screen at 120 frame 4K 3D. Here at Trumbull Studios, we're shooting a demonstration film called Ufotar. And action. I was the lead nuke engineer. On the SSN 23, Jimmy Carter. It is being produced at 120 frames per second in 4K 3D, and we're using dual Canon C500 cameras mounted on a Thereality TS5 3D rig, recording to codex recorders. Our studio is a laboratory where we can experiment, collaborate with world-class talents, and explore a new kind of immersive experience that goes beyond any film process ever known. There's folks after me, because I'm the only guy who's figured out how to get it. Focus on that, lock off. Yeah, I'm just gonna move on uh, because we're, I'm running out of time and I'm gonna jump past some of this stuff. Today we have basically 2K at 24 frames per second on movies and television. We do have giant screen IMAX. Uh, we have premium large format, which is 4K digital. We have television, which is now headed toward 4K and 8K. We have computer games, which are 60 frames per second 72 frames per second or 90 frames per second. We need more frames per second for fast action in computer games. We have virtual reality heading to higher frame rates and deeper 3D experiences. Um, we have augmented reality, which is the real world mixed with computer generated imagery. And then this Magi process I'm developing, which is 4K 120 frame per second on a giant screen for large groups of people. Um, and then there's the planetarium dome screen, which is what it is. If you've ever been to a planetarium, you, you know that you can't tell a story on a dome. So you gotta find some hybrid safe space between a dome and a flat screen, which is what I've been doing with Magi. Virtual reality is a very powerful Sorry. new medium. Yes, go ahead, Santiago. I hate, I, well, I hate to be that guy. But okay. I am, I am that guy right now. You are that guy. Uh, okay. Um, uh, if we can wrap up in three minutes, that'll leave time for what I'm presuming going to be a lot of different questions because you've raised a lot of different super interesting points. Okay. Um, do you think that uh, we can uh, get there? Or is yeah. Some... Okay. Let me show you. I'm going to try to just show you one more clip. And then I'll be done. And then I'll be done because I'm nearly at the end. I'm just showing you some images of behind the scenes stuff at our studio um, of this Magi pod um, and this whole idea. So I think I'll wrap it up quickly. In order for the theatrical movie industry to survive and flourish, it must offer a giant screen experience that is so spectacular and high in quality 
that the sense of immersion cannot be obtained on a small screen. This differentiation could bring audiences back to movie theaters, but only if the theaters themselves transform into a much more powerful and immersive technology using larger screens, brighter laser projection, higher resolution, 3D, wider field of view, and spectacular stereophonic sound that cannot be achieved on a small screen. Okay, I think we could call it quits right here.